Rolling Rock Mechanics Association, ARMA, and specific, specifically the Induced Seismicity Technical Committee. So just quickly, if you're not familiar with ARMA, it's, uh, it's a professional society focused on rock mechanics or really geomechanics. So it encompasses petroleum, mining, civil, different, uh, different aspects of, uh, of geomechanics. Um, so <clears throat> I'd encourage everyone, if you're not familiar with ARMA, the, the website's at the bottom. Please uh, investigate it. It's, uh, it's an excellent uh, association and uh, very good, uh, good resource for case studies and technology related to geomechanics. Um, so as part of their initiatives, there's topical technical subcommittees. And uh, myself and Kathy Kellencheck have, for the last two years, run a committee focused on induced seismicity. And a very topical uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, observation, I guess, with induced seismicity, but very appropriate to be under the ARMA umbrella in that it's really a, a geomechanics issue issue that, uh, that many industries are, are dealing with. So as part of our, uh, our efforts, we've decided, let's see if I can get my screen to advance here, there we go, um, kind of following a lead from the hydraulic fracturing community that uh, many people are probably familiar with, we, uh, we took the notion of having a series of webinars focused on induced seismicity. And in fact, our inaugural first kind of kickoff was two weeks ago, Peter Hennings with the BEG spoke to uh, the topic of induced seismicity as a joint hydraulic fracture induced seismicity committee webinar. And we used that event to kind of kick off this, uh, this series. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful for two volunteers that have sort of stepped up to help us um, coordinate these, these webinars. Jens Lundsnee, who was actually one of our presenters, uh, students, uh, one of Mark Sovak's students, and now at the USGS, and Mahadi Haddad the, with the BEG is the other coordinator helping uh, run the, the Zoom and also uh, helping coordinate the, uh, the webinar series. So we'll talk more about this. Uh, Jens is gonna introduce the schedule here in a moment, but kind of the concept is during the, uh, the shutdown period as society deals with the COVID issue, um, we thought it would be informative to uh, have a, an opportunity for people to share information. And we thought it'd be interesting to have kind of a, a global look, sort of around the world in 80 days kind of theme for a, a series of webinars over the next few months looking at induced seismicity in different areas. And, we're very uh, fortunate to have Professor Mark Sobak from uh, Stanford give the, uh, the first webinar here. So Mark's well known and his, his uh, brief highlights of his bio was included in the, the meeting invite. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the, the details, but uh, I would like to point out kind of two aspects that uh, weren't in the highlights of his, uh, his bio that I think are important. So Mark's both a, a fellow of ARMA and as well as a past president of ARMA. So obviously has strong ties to the, the Rock Mechanics Association and uh, we're thankful that Mark was agreed to give this, uh, this inaugural webinar today. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jens to, uh, to talk about the upcoming uh, uh, webinars. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, along the lines of the uh, Around the World in 80 Days theme, we have lined up a number of very, um, I think I can speak for all of us in, uh, in the organizing group for saying that, that we're quite excited by the, the speakers and the topics um, that we have lined up so far. Of course, today we have Mark Zoback uh, from Stanford, uh, and we'll be doing this in, in about every two week increments, typically on, on um, Fridays at 10 a.m. Central, but you'll see some variability um, um, in, the, in the schedule. Um, to accommodate certain certain um, uh, speakers and holidays. So the next speaker is uh, Dave Eaton from the University of Calgary, and he'll be talking about aseismic fault creep leading to hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. Um, you'll be receiving uh, reminders and, and uh, invitations to each of these uh, every two weeks. 
After that, two weeks later, we have James Verdon from the University of Bristol, and he'll be talking about the, the case of uh, induced seismicity associated with hydraulic fracturing in Lancashire, England. And uh, after that, we have Zhi Zhang from the University of Science and Technology of China, who will be talking about the, um, the very consequential uh, um, examples of potentially induced seismicity in the Sichuan Basin there in China. Uh, and then Stu Venables from the BC Oil and Gas Commission speaking specifically about regulatory uh, approach and case studies in the BC area. And we're continuing to line up new speakers, so um, stay tuned. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mahdi Haddad, one of the organizing committee members of uh, these webinars. Uh, it's uh, a great honor to have all of you here. So far, we have around 115 participants. In order to make the flow of these webinars uh, smoothly, we have made some simple rules uh, for the participants and for questioning and so on. So everyone who has received the invitation email for this webinar, we receive invitation emails for the upcoming webinars, unless they let us know uh, that they uh, want to discontinue receiving these emails. Uh, please do not forward the webinar invites because we would like to uh, keep track of the attendees uh, list. Uh, instead, forward interested parties to the community, me, Jens, and Sean, to be uh, added to the uh, distribution. Everyone will be muted during the talk, uh, and uh, please submit your questions during or after the talk in the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting window. Please send these questions to everyone because we would like to summarize in some cases to uh, to just remove rep repetitive questions. Uh, this Zoom meeting is recorded and the link to the recording will be shared after the webinar. So uh, without further delay, let's ask Dr. Zobak to start his presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you. Um, let's see if we can uh, make this work. Okay, is that working? Yes. Good. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to talk uh, as part of this uh, webinar series. Uh, I've been in, interested in due seismicity my, my entire career. I was a graduate student not all that long after the uh, famous experiments at the Denver uh, Arsenal and Rangeley oil field were carried out. And it occurred to me that um, induced seismicity is really a way we can take what we study theoretically, take what we study in the lab, and try to you know, apply it in a practical way to something which has a great, great import. And so my, my talk today, uh, it's kind of a grandiose title of uh, you know, physics-based methods, but I wanna talk about two very practical questions. I think as we, as we approach issues of induced seismicity, we, we have to wear two hats. We wear a hat <clears throat> in which as scientists we can help companies, help the public, help regulators in a very practical way, uh, reduce uh, the risk associated uh, with induced seismicity. And then, uh, of course, as scientists, we want to understand the phenomenology as best we can, and we can use uh, far more uh, sophisticated uh, ideas and test concepts uh, when we're wearing that hat. But the first part of my talk, I really want to talk about, can we identify potentially active faults? Prior to produce water injection, can you anticipate and avoid problems? And then second, can we use physics-based models to guide regulatory aspects of uh, oil and gas development when induced seismicity is concerned? Because if we don't, the regulatory system will move forward um, in a non-scientific way. So it's really important for us to contribute. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a screening tool we've built as part of the SKITS consortium called FSP, Fault slip potential to kind of a, can we identify potentially problematic faults then um, building on uh, Serge Shapiro's uh, seismogenic index model we'll talk about integration of Coulomb faulting theory with pore fluid diffusion which takes the physics and turns it into sort of a statistical approach um, and I'll talk about our um, application in Oklahoma uh, led by uh, Cornelius Longenbrook 
And finally, I want to say just a few words about, you know, moving to more sophisticated uh, physical models. And the one I'm going to uh, talk about is one we've been working on quite a bit, but presents enormous challenges, and that's to incorporate poroelastic stress changes into our sort of predictive calculations. Um, you know, it's, it's something, you know, we need to do. Uh, we need to extend beyond simple theories, but it's, it's difficult. And I'm gonna use poroelasticity um, as an example of those difficulties, okay? So uh, I could talk for days about testing Coulomb faulting theory, but everything uh, we know to date suggests that it's, it's remarkably applicable to understanding stress magnitudes at depth and, um, and how, how faults work. And you know, we've done a lot of work uh, looking at stress magnitudes and well bores. On, on the left is the work we did uh, in collaboration with our uh, German colleagues uh, that demonstrated that stresses are increasing as predicted by Coulomb faulting theory, the crustids and frictional equilibrium, a very small pressure change, even in a relatively stable part of, of intraplate Europe, triggered small earthquakes with a small perturbation. And it was all understandable in terms of the kinds of things um, we study in the lab. More recently, using very precise relative relocations of small earthquakes, um, uh, Martin Schoenball and Bill Ellsworth have shown that the orientation of faults as determined by the, you know, the, the trend of, of, of hypocenters um, once they're relocated with respect to each other in north central Oklahoma is exactly as predicted by uh, Coulomb faulting theory. Uh, we know the stress field in this area very well. It's about north 85 east. It's characterized principally by strike slope faulting. So Coulomb faulting theory very simply would indicate the, you know, the faults would be near vertical and striking more or less 30 degrees uh, from either side of the SH max direction. And that's exactly what this histogram of fault trends uh, turns out to be. So Coulomb faulting theory both predicts stress magnitude and the orientation of stress uh, with respect to potentially active faults. The perturbation of core pressure in this case was very small. And so therefore, these are potentially active faults in a geologic sense that were triggered by the increase in core pressure. Um, you know, Oklahoma drew our attention um, about six years ago because the background rate of seismicity uh, by mag magnitude minus uh, magnitude uh, four or, uh, earthquake, uh, basically about once per decade, were in increasing uh, to the rate of about one per week in late 2015, 2016. So all these red dots, this is kind of a dated uh, map from one of our earlier papers. The red dots are uh, seismic events that were triggered by injection into the blue crosses, which are saltwater disposal wells. This story is pretty well known now, I'm not gonna belabor it, but basically massive amounts of water were being produced from formations like the Mississippi line, and they were being injected more deeply down into the Arbuckle formation, uh, which is porous, permeable, underpressured. The pressure spread out found critically stressed faults in the basement, the fluid pressure uh, uh, penetrated those faults and caused earthquakes uh, down, down in the basement. Um, the uh, Arbuckle is a great disposal zone. The issue was that in 2014 alone, 700 million barrels were uh, injected into the Arbuckle, which caused this regional phenomenon. And here we're showing um, the density, how much uh, fluid was injected in a given area and where the earthquakes were occurring in both the, the, the back, you know, the, the number of uh, relatively small earthquakes as well as the larger earthquakes are all occurring in this area of very intense uh, fluid injection. Now, um, Raul Walsh and I um, looked at this question, well, if we you know, know a fault is present, if we know the stress field is there, can we identify and avoid uh, injection or pressurization of a potentially active active fault. And the argument is, well, everything we know uh, suggests Coulomb faulting theory is working. So if we know the state of stress, if we know the fault orientation, we know something about the expected pore pressure perturbation, we can argue that yes, a fault is potentially uh, reactivatable. 
But we also need to incorporate the uncertainties in these key, key parameters uh, into our analysis. <clears throat> so looking at uh, North Central Oklahoma, uh, Richard Alt and I began a process of uh, very carefully mapping the stress field and these, these heavy bars are well more indicators of SH max. The inward arrows are from focal mechanism inversions and as you can see, they compare quite well. Um, we used the uh, uh, fault information in the public domain that was uh, compiled by the Oklahoma Geological Survey and we put it all together to try to see if we could predict which faults would be most active. Um, when we apply it to areas of known faulting, like the uh, display of the Rosetta Fault that produced a magnitude five earthquake in 2011, um, we can demonstrate that incorporating the uncertainties uh, into the analysis, we would have predicted that there was something on the order of a 50% probability that a poor pressure perturbation uh, could have triggered that, that slip. The great majority of faults are not likely to slip. They're old, they were introduced, uh, uh, well, the basement rocks here are 1.2 billion years old, so they've been introduced sometime in the geologic past and they're not of concern because their orientation to the current stress field is inappropriate for triggering under a relatively small pressure perturbation. Most importantly, um, it also, the methodology also allows us to rule out faults and there had been speculation that this big fault that goes right through Oklahoma City, the Nemaha Fault, was potentially uh, problematic because it, um, you know, there was oil and gas development, there was fluid injection um, near it. Um, but in fact, it's almost dead perpendicular um, to the current SH max direction and a steeply dipping fault would not be expected to slip even had it been pressurized all the way up to the frac gradient. So identifying problematic faults is important, but identifying faults that are not likely to be problematic um, is just as important. Now, what is buried back in the appendices of the Walsh and Zoback paper is how we assigned uncertainties to the different parameters. And we spent a lot of time talking about this. And I, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to read that section of the paper carefully. You know, we want to, you know, express our uncertainty in whatever parameter we're dealing with, um, but we don't want to overdo it. In other words, if you open up everything, uh, allow friction to vary all over the place, allow stress to vary, allow pore pressure to vary, well, then anything can happen and every fault is potentially problematic. And so you, you, you have to think about this kind of carefully, establish reasonable bounds of uncertainty and move forward. But it's, um, it's, it's the hard part uh, of the analysis and uh, it requires a, a great deal of thought. And I'm not gonna um, build on that, but I hope uh, you take that um, um, uh, advice seriously should you uh, use FSP. Looking backward, um, we looked at every one of the significant earthquakes, which are here shown by the, um, the yellow stars, significant in the sense that of course they're larger and also significant in the sense that they're large enough that focal plane mechanisms are available. And we could, in, you know, each and every case, find a plane that was uh, the potential causative plane in the context of Coulomb faulting theory, uh, knowing the, the, the stress state. So, you know, in a retrospective test, it works. But, and this is the really important part, we only knew about the presence of these faults after the earthquakes occurred. So in this area, where we have very good knowledge of the stress state, it's really the poor knowledge of the faults in the subsurface that's the limiting uh, factor in uh, more widespread uh, application of the methodology. Um, you know, uh, in many areas uh, we, we think, well, understanding the stress state is very difficult, and in some areas it might be, but our experience has been um, in these areas of oil and gas development, it's easier to get good data on what the stresses are um, than it is to get good data on what the faults are in the subsurface. Um, so as part of the SKITS consortium, we've developed and released uh, a tool called uh, uh, Fault Slip Potential, FSP. We developed this and released it in conjunction with ExxonMobil. Uh, it allows you to incorporate uh, wells and faults uh, 
you can do some simple hydrology uh, radial flow in the model, although we, you know, we, we, you know, we encourage people to actually use a, a more detailed uh, hydrologic model and incorporate that into FSP. Uh, of course, you can do a geomechanical analysis and calculate the false slip potential. And then you can see, as shown in this uh, lower right corner, which parameters in your model are most important. So as you try to improve your models, um, it, it shows you where to emphasize, you know, what parameters are uh, most important and what to emphasize as you move forward. This is uh, freeware available at the Skits website. And um, it's glad, uh, you know, it's really comforting to see many people using the software. Uh, Peter Hennings, uh, uh, as part of the Scissor Group and TexNet at um, the University of Texas, uh, uh, applied FSP working together with Jens and as a nice collaboration between Scissor and Skits and did an analysis um, uh, for the Fort Worth Basin, uh, taking a, a new and very detailed fault model that they made, uh, our best estimates at the stress, calculated fault slip potential. And what they showed is that if you look at all the fault segments uh, that they mapped, of course, they have a wide range of, of fault slip potential. Some seem pretty uh, potentially problematic. Many, many were not. But more importantly, when they actually look at the faults associated with the earthquakes, you know, they're, they're really all showing uh, the fact that there is, you know, significant fault slip potential. If there's a 20% chance of inducing slip on a fault, I personally would not encourage injection to occur close to it. And, um, and so again, in, in a sense, this is a retrospective analysis, but demonstrating that the methodology uh, can work quite well on, on the basin scale as well as the individual fault scale. Um, within the last two weeks, uh, 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 Jens Lundsny, who you already met, and I published a, a new, new generation uh, stress map for North America. It appeared in Nature Communications. Uh, there's uh, about 700 new stress indicators that have come from my group uh, over the past five or six years. Uh, most, mostly it's Jens, Jens's work. And then uh, using about 2,000 earthquakes, we're mapping relative stress magnitude. In other words, uh, the red colors are the most compressive stress state and the uh, blue colors are the least compressive stress state. And you see this pattern of decreasing compressive stress from, from the northeast, uh, south, uh, southeastern Canada, northeastern U.S. into the, the mid-continent. There are some areas, um, central Canada, for example, where there are very few earthquakes, almost none, no oil and gas development, and there's a bit of extrapolation and interpolation, and, and so we're rather uncertain. Uh, the, uh, a couple years ago, Jens and I published uh, a fault slip potential map for the Permian Basin. Um, we uh, are in the process of redoing that again in collaboration with the with the scissor group and, and again it's the fault data often that's the uh, most uh, important missing uh, piece of information also um, Jens and I are are now uh, writing a paper in which we're zooming in on all of the different um, unconventional oil and gas basins and and going through the stress state in each of those regions separately. And that's the kind of information one would use on a local scale, whether you're working in the Marcellus or you're working in the Bakken, uh, uh, the Delaware Basin or, or whatever. So this Im improved knowledge of the stress state is, uh, is well along and uh, the publication of these data are coming, are coming soon. Moving on to the, the second topic, uh, using the seismogenic index model, um, much of this is, is known, but I want to highlight a couple of points. Um, we were first motivated to work on this when um, regulators in Oklahoma uh, mandated a 40% reduction of injection as a way of reducing the uh, intense seismicity uh, that had, uh, well, which I showed you uh, before. And the question we wanted to consider is, is how was the seismicity going to respond? Uh, was 40% enough? Should it, been larger? Was it too much? You know, what could one expect? And we turn to the seismogenic index model uh, developed by Shapiro and his students over a number of years. And there are a lot of things I like about the model. Uh, first, it assumes there's a wide variety of pre-existing faults in the crust. Um, in their 
parameterization, they call them very weak faults and very strong faults. Um, I would call weak faults those that are critically stressed, those are appropriately oriented for slip in the current stress field, and those which are strong are faults which are poorly oriented and, and are really aren't going to slip. And so it integrates this idea of uh, faults of many different orientations, of pressure diffusion, spreading out, changing uh, the effect of stress, uh, effect of normal stress on those faults, and then uh, you know, triggering slip in accordance with, with Coulomb faulting theory. The key part uh, of it that makes this uh, translate into a statistical method is it modifies the classical Gutenberg-Richter law by uh, taking the seismicity rate, the A value, uh, for those of you uh, familiar with Gutenberg-Richter, and breaks it down into two components. One component um, is the volume injected or the pressure rate, the, either the volume rate, which is what we used initially, or the pressure rate, which we use subsequently. So this is the perturbation, and uh, sigma here is the seismogenic index, which is describing the state of the crust. In other words, uh, how many critically stressed faults are, are potentially uh, reactivatable in a, in a given region. So both are important. Uh, the geology is important that you're uh, working in, and the perturbation is important. And that's what uh, we're able to do in a statistical way using the seismogenic index model. So our initial work um, uh, led us to predict the decay of, uh, of seismicity, and it, it worked, you know, it's worked pretty well. Uh, we made this prediction back in 2016. If anything, we've, we've over-predicted the seismicity, which is, which is good. Um, and it allows us to, to say, you know, what the probability of an earthquake of any magnitude might be in any given year. And so the background rate, you know, we had one magnitude four about every 10 years. And of course, by the time, um, you know, we got to the peak seismicity, uh, you know, we were having a magnitude four every week. The probability of having a magnitude five was a 90%. And then as the injection rate began to decrease, these curves started to move back, back to the left. But it's going to take a long time to get back to the, uh, the, the background rate. We improved on this model when Matt Weingarten joined our group, and we uh, improved on it by developing a hydrologic model. And so, so now we could look at the pressure rate in the basement um, as best we could. Um, it was a hard model to constrain. And so now we, we made two improvements to the, uh, this initial paper. One was to look directly at the pressurization rate. And now what we can see is the earthquake rate in green is really matching the pressurization rate uh, in, the, um, in several kilometers into the basement uh, quite well. The other improvement we made is rather than developing a seismogenic index for two large areas, we did it on a more granular basis. <clears throat> to demonstrate that this would work, we made maps using data available in 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017. And what you can see is that the overall patterns are really quite consistent. It's a log scale. So what this is saying is that the yellow areas are you know, more than an order of magnitude more susceptible to produce seismicity in response to a given perturbation than the blue areas. And this degree of variability, you see, is, is really quite consistent over different periods of time. And this spatial variability is helping us understand why we're getting a lot of earthquakes in some places and relatively few in others when the you know, injection might be, and the pressure change at depth might be relatively similar. I frankly um, was greatly heartened by the fact that these maps don't change over time, and I was uh, frankly surprised that the very, by the degree of variability, that some areas were truly, you know, an order of magnitude more sensitive, if you, you know, use that term, uh, than others. Why well, then, mapping seismogenic index on a finer scale and then having a hydrologic model that could then be used to predict how pressures are going to change in time, we could combine that 
and actually look at the probability of say uh, a magnitude four, which is a widely felt but not damaging earthquake, what's the probability of a magnitude four occurring within some 20 kilometer radius? This is just how we chose to represent it. And what you can see is that that probability is quite high, you know, where the earthquakes were occurring in 2015, it started to reduce as a result of the reduced injection rates, okay, and still a fairly good correlation. And we're, um, we're predicting the future and um, we'll see how this, uh, how this holds up. Of course, another thing that's been happening in Oklahoma as the uh, uh, produced water injection has subsided is that hydraulic fracturing um, had been increasing, at least until the uh, crash in oil prices, and earthquakes associated with hydraulic fracturing, um, which are shown by these uh, blue dots, uh, have been occurring. And what uh, Cornelius and I uh, have now been working, more recently been working on, is to determine whether or not we can apply this seismogenic index model to hydraulic fracturing induced earthquakes. And remember, you know, when we're, we're talking about hydraulic fracturing in this context, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of wells, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of hydraulic fracturing operations going on. It's not, you know, a well or two and a, a, a frack or two. And so there's a really a robust level of activity, a regional response um, to that seismic, uh, to that uh, perturbation. Anyway, this is a, a bit of a more difficult problem, but um, we're plugging away at it. Okay, so those are sort of practical tools that can be used uh, and provide useful information uh, to the public, useful information to um, regulators, uh, operators, and so on. Now let me transition and talk about the use of, of more sophisticated models. And, and there are a lot of different kinds of sophisticated models that people are using. And we need to use these models to better understand um, you know, the phenomenon. But I, I'm going to talk about poor elastic stress changes. It's because it's something we've worked on quite a bit. And I'm just struck by how difficult it is to make the transition from what is sort of a, a research project into something that makes practical predictions um, in a reliable way. And this work is based on uh, uh, the work of Lei Jin in his PhD thesis and two papers we've, we've published. Um, and in fact, we're, we're working on still additional papers. So my, my uh, provisos and uh, warning, the, the sort of the, uh, the sobering remarks I'm about to make is not because I, I don't think uh, poor elastic uh, models are important. I, it's just the opposite. I think they're extremely important, but um, there are a number of, uh, so we've published two papers, we've actually published three papers, we're working on a fourth now, so we're in this game, but it's, it's, it's really hard to go from sort of theory and um, what we know from the lab and, and, and put it into practical application. And I want to illustrate that in three ways. One is that the pore pressure and of course and the stress changes that are occurring in the subsurface are very heterogeneous, especially in low permeability fractured rock masses. Therefore, you've got to describe those heterogeneities quite accurately, and your model results are going to depend on how you, you know, what you put into it. So it's, it, it's difficult to generalize, although I'll generalize in a minute. Um, uh, it's difficult uh, because of these heterogeneities dominating uh, often what we see. The second issue is that poor elastic parameters are very difficult to estimate, especially in low permeability fractured rocks. I'll show you some lab data. And the, the third thing is that we've got to be careful and make sure the poor elastic models we're using are, are fully coupled models. Now this, <clears throat> this is some calculations we're right in the middle of, and uh, the context is, is not important for this presentation. Uh, you're looking at a plan view of one stage. So there's a horizontal well here. Um, five hydraulic fractures um, are being, were, were in fact propagated uh, from this stage in our model at least. And then we've introduced uh, some pre-existing fractures and faults. And we pumped into this well for a week. And this was kind of looking at 
ideas that are floating around about repressurization of depleted wells and whether or not um, you can avoid a well-to-well -well interaction. So that's, that's the background, but it's really not important. The thing I wanna show you is that even after a week of pumping, the pressure changes are concentrated around the permeable pathways, the hydraulic fractures and the pre-existing um, faults uh, that we, we, we put into the model. So the, the pore pressure change is not homogeneous at all because the, you know, the, the matrix is assumed to be 100 nanodarcies and the hydraulic fractures um, and the pre-existing uh, fractures have order, you know, orders and orders of magnitude more permeability. The second issue to point out is that the XX stress, which is the horizontal direction, and the YY stress are both increasing. And in general, poor elasticity tends to increase the mean normal stress in the area away from the injection, which tends often to suppress seismicity. Okay, and, um, and that's a point often overlooked. My colleague Paul Siegel uh, looked at the, the special case of normal faulting, and so this, the, the, the poor elastic stress, the push outward from the uh, injection point here, is increasing the normal stress on these faults, uh, um, say here and here, and suppressing seismicity. Although, and Paul, you know, what they looked at was over time, of course, the fluid pressure is increasing, which tends to encourage seismicity. And so these two are working in opposite directions, but if you, you know, uh, stop injecting suddenly, the pore pressure is still high, the poor elastic stress goes away, and that might induce slip um, when a pump is shut off because the poor elastic stress instantaneously uh, disappears. Um, that is an observation for this particular geometry, but needs to be, needs to be kept in mind that this increase in mean normal stress away from the uh, point of injection, uh, its, its basic effect is, is to suppress seismicity. Poor elastic parameters uh, that we need to put into this model, as, you know, the BO coefficient, for example, are very hard to measure. Um, this is from a paper uh, that Xiaodong Ma and I published um, in, in 2017. We did very careful laboratory measurements on samples from the Bakken formation. Now, these are very hard to do. And to determine the BO coefficient, we had to measure volumetric strain at many different confining pressures and many different pore pressures. And so you can see the suite of measurements made here. So, you know, it, it, it's really a, a complicated set of uh, laboratory experiments. When we Actually, and we increased and decreased uh, both pressures. Um, when we plot the BO coefficient as a function of the simple effective stress, we see it, it's really not a function of simple effective stress. Um, and it's you know, quite variable depending on the, uh, the pore pressure, for example. And the numbers are ranging between uh, about 0.35 and about 0.75, okay? You can see that for yourself. We, whoops, sorry. When we, actually separated the experiments in which pressure was going down, simulating depletion, and pressure going up, simulating injection, what you see is a, a lot of uh, hysteresis. And I, I pointed to this one experiment, you know, um, just sort of arbitrarily, but under the same combination of confining pressure and pore pressure, if uh, for those conditions, the BO coefficient is about a factor of two different depending on whether you're in a depletion mode or an injection mode. And so, you know, even something as simple as a basic pore elastic parameter, and the BO coefficient is, is that, um, is very difficult to measure and, and, and therefore hard to implement um, in, in studies. So, the heterogeneity of the earth um, is very important. The material is very important. And, and the model is very important. And, and Lay has uh, been rather um, militant in arguing that we may have to make sure we're using fully coupled poor elastic models. And I'm not going to slog through the, through the equations, but the way to think about these poor elastic stresses 
is that the pressure gradients, which are related to flow, create body forces that perturb the stress field. So the pressure gradient, or if you think about, if you want to think about where and how flow is occurring, that's what's introducing the perturbation. Um, and, and that's what we need to consider, both how the pore pressure affects the stress and how the stress affects the pore pressure. And an illustration of that from Lay's thesis is, is shown here. He's injecting at a constant pressure um, into a, a well, which he's introduced uh, pre-existing fractures, okay? And he's just looking at this over different periods of time as you move from left to right. Um, the top two rows are showing mean normal stress. The bottom two rows are showing an invariant of the uh, deviatoric stress tensor. And <coughs> each of the rows under each pair compares a fully coupled model with sort of a one-way coupling in which you're only looking at the pressure-induced stress. And the takeaway message here is that the, you know, the one-way coupling always, always produces a much larger effect than the fully coupled model. And so, you know, it's really important um, to, to look at this um, carefully. Um, something I learned from Jens, uh, uh, excuse me, from, from Lay um, recently is in Abacus, for those that use it, they, they do have a fully coupled mode, but they ignore the BO coefficient, so they over predict the, um, uh, you know, uh, the effective stress. So anyway, uh, take that as a, um, uh, a little bit of information if that's a, if that's a code. Uh, that's a code you're using. So to wind, wind things up, uh, can we identify potentially active faults prior to produce water injection or hydraulic fracturing? I think the answer is yes. I think these models have great practical utility, but we should think of it as a screening process. And we can do this either at a local scale or we can do it at a basin scale. And uh, we're hard at work uh, at, at that um, in areas of, of interest to industry, um, in North America at least. Can we use these physics-based statistical models to guide regulatory aspects of oil and gas development? I think we can. And um, the regulators in Oklahoma asked us if we would be willing to update our models every month, and we politely declined. But the point is, they have to make decisions. And if they decided, uh, for example, that uh, they would like to allow more injection, well, we could put that in the model and, 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 and try to determine what might happen. So, Having a model for decision making, a physical model, is, is a very valuable thing once you have some confidence that that statistical model is working. And can we use relatively sophisticated models incorporating poor elasticity, rate and, freight, rate and state friction, dynamic rupture modeling, et cetera? Absolutely, we have to do that. But um, I just used the one example to emphasize the challenges of going from the theory and the lab into the earth. And, and I think right now, the way I kind of look at induced seismicity is I, I sort of separate my brain and think, well, what can we do of practical importance and what do we need to do to do to better understanding what's hap you know, happening in the earth, which gets us into the third bullet and causes um, us to you know, um, you know, think much more deeply uh, about, about the challenge of all this. And uh, what, what came to mind um, was a quote from Richard Feynman. If you thought that science was certain, well, that's just an error on your part. And uh, I think that that says a lot. I think, you know, as we as a community work in this third bullet, especially, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of back and forth, things we learn, things, we, things mistakes we make, uh, models we change, but that's part of the scientific process. We, we have to do it, but we have to remember that you know, we, we have these two roles to play and we have to, to the best we can, uh, help decision makers uh, in their, in, in the challenge of, of dealing with uh, due seismicity. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Mark, for the excellent presentation. And uh, just a reminder to everyone that uh, we'll take questions through the group chat. So, Mark, it looks like if you want to open the, the chat window yourself, you could maybe uh, select a few that you think might okay. uh, let's answer the, seems to be a few on seismogenic index in particular. Uh, I need, hold on, I need to uh, get the, huh. 
Right, for some reason, oh, um, I think if I stop sharing, okay. Uh, and now I can see the chat window. Okay, um, excuse me, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, Sean, you asked a, um, uh, a good question. You know, how do we use a seismogenetic index for a region if there's only a sparse historic catalog? Uh, frankly, I don't think you can. Um, a very important part of the seismogenetic index, two, the two important parts, are understanding the rate of seismicity compared to the rate of pressurization. And the second is having some estimate of what the B value is. Uh, you can assume a B value, which, but really it's only applicable when there is a, a you know, seismicity is ongoing. Um, you, I, I don't think you, can, you could just translate, especially when we look at that market difference in the, in the uh, seismogenic index itself from one area to another. I don't think we could um, forecast, uh, uh, you know, put the, use the model in forecasting in the absence of, of background seismicity. Um, there's a very detailed question about the cybergenetic index model and I'd like to encourage the person asking it to uh, just send me an email about it. I think it's it's getting down in, into some of the details that would be hard to hard to answer uh, just you know in real time here. Yes, um, Mark. Maybe just to summarize a few of them. There seems to be a few questions around applying the seismogenic index to hydraulic fracturing, and it, so to me, it sort of ties back to the last part where you were talking about the poor elastic kind of modeling. So what are your thoughts for uh, maybe expansion of the seismogenic index specifically for the, uh, the aspect of hydraulic fracturing? I think, mm -hmm. I think it's okay uh, in a regional way. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, that map I showed, uh, the blue dots, which I said were associated with hydraulic fracturing, and that comes from the uh, Oklahoma Geological Surveys, you know, the filter they applied for time and space correlations to, uh, to label a specific earthquake as being associated with hydraulic fracturing. Of course, that's a research question in, in and of itself, uh, but it's very patchy. And so I would think that aspect of the seismogenic index model will translate over. But um, it's, so I think there, there will be more uh, areas that are more prone to hydraulic fracturing induced earthquakes, but you're lumping a lot of geology into a single number, the seismogenic index. And that's, that's kind of a complicated thing to do. You also have to figure out what the metric is for the perturbation. So when we're talking about Oklahoma seismicity, you know, the regional pressurization rate, because the Arbuckle is so permeable, right? All those different injection wells are causing the pressure perturbation. Hydraulic fracturing, the perturbation is much more localized, right? And so when we think about the perturbation, are we thinking about the amount of fluid injected per stage in a given amount of time, right? Or multiple stages, or, you know, is the, is the pore pressure accumulating rapidly because we're doing stages or, or um, we're doing zipper fracking and we have nearby wells and that's all adding up very fast. And so the Pressurization rate is very dependent on details of the operations and that and that you know in that our first attempt We looked only at the volume of fluid injected and we saw some correlation there But there are these time and geometry aspects that are hard to unravel and that's basically that's why we um, um, That's why we, <laughs> we're not done with the work. It's just it's just hard to do um, okay, I'm working on Dave Eaton asked if we uh, have incorporated uncertainty in the BO parameters into FSP uh, for slip hop, probably. Uh, no, we haven't. And, and, the, and the reason we haven't is, um, you know, the, the, way, the way I look at FSP, first is it's a screening tool, it's not a precise modeling tool, and we're looking at the effective normal stress and friction seems to obey 
you know, the SN minus pore pressure, the sigma normal, without the modification of the BO coefficient. So we're thinking about the pore pressure acting in the fault, not so much the pore pressure in the surrounding medium and affecting the stress in which the fault is embedded. Because again, um, that's a complicated issue. Um, here's a question. Um, well, it's about seismic index model and hydraulic fracturing. And I think I, um, I think I um, answered that, except it points out that the abacus does include the effect of the VO by accounting for different rock matrix and rock grain compressibility. Okay, well, um, we, we've not been using abacus for this and maybe I uh, overstated its limitations. Uh, uh, that's a, a, a point um, worth making. And so uh, that's something to be revisited. Um, let's see. So Ramin asked a question about seismogenic index related uh, to Western Canada. Uh, so, so it's just uh, two questions about. Um, my dog's answering that question uh, right now. Um, um, Must be a Canadian Labrador retriever, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think the first, uh, the first issue, of course, uh, so the question is about applying the seismogenic index model in Canada where the size, because of the station distribution is sparse uh, and location errors are high, the seismicity, I'm just reading the question basically, seismicity cannot be precisely attributed to any specific well. Um, in a seismogenic index calculated for a relatively large area, which includes multiple injection wells of different, is that still valid? Well, that's exactly the situation in Oklahoma with the saltwater disposal. I think the question in Canada would be, well, is that the mechanism? Are there multiple disposal wells contributing to a regional pressure change, or is the seismicity associated with individual wells and uh, hydraulic fracturing operations? And I think we, we sort of have to get the context right of what the association between the, um, the earthquake um, and the, the poor pressure perturbation is in order to, you know, start the process of knowing whether it's applicable or not. So Mark, I think we're starting to approach the end of the time so we can call it, uh, call it wraps there. I think your, your offer for email exchanges would be uh, a good way to uh, get into the, some of the more detailed questions anyways, rather than try to ask you to read the chat and <laughs> answer on the fly. But uh, I guess one of the challenges with uh, these webinars is, not having the, uh, the opportunity for uh, a round of applause to thank the speaker, but I'm sure I can sense that virtual round of applause is happening over, over Zoom, but uh, I'm sure I can speak for the entire uh, attendees to the presentation. As always, an excellent presentation, an excellent overview, and uh, um, on behalf of the, the organizing committee, we really appreciate your assistance and uh, stepping up to kind of kick this off for us. Well, 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 thanks for, thanks for doing this. And I'm looking forward to the, uh, the future webinars. Thank you. Excellent. And then just a reminder to everyone, we'll be uh, sending out uh, an invitation to the next one, two weeks from now, Dave Eaton's going to be talking more specifically about a seismic slip and some of the observations from Western Canada. So another, uh, another great webinar to come. So thank you to everyone and uh, have a, have a good day. Stay safe and healthy. Everyone. Me too. Thank you so much.